Ladies and gentlemen, I decided to do the Corey I video separately, and so this is just a combination of me talking into the cell phone and expressing my thoughts to some of you. I hope the information proves helpful. Okay, stay tuned. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gents. We're going to be doing our little Cape A Talk program here. Haven't done this in a while, so it's going to be one of those things where I guess there's going to be some enjoyment. Got to change some settings while I'm talking, but <laughs> let's just say we're about to have some information divulging. Now, often I tell people I am not their repository. I am not here just to be given information. Now, I've never volunteered, nor has it ever been my wish, to serve as your source of information. The fact that I sit up here and I talk into a microphone and I decide to put those thoughts on the internet so that they're available to the public does not mean that I am available to the public. I have people telling me that I have a responsibility to them. <laughs> ah! Oh, God. Um, I have somebody trying to call me, and so I'm going to have to pause this. So, ladies and gentlemen, uno momento. Okay, back to the conversation at hand. So, basically it boils down to this. I don't feel obligated to you. I'm not obligated to you. And when I say to you, that means everybody listening to this. Let's talk to all of you as one. And let's give you the respect you deserve by referring to you by your name. You. So, Ross Perot time. You people. This is not that type of, how would you say, life. No one has ever volunteered to engage in such a life, nor did I. I only put these videos up here because there were a lot of people leaving out information. And now I have people saying that I'm leaving out information. Well, now I'm starting to understand why those other people left out so much information. Because if we gave you everything, that means you wouldn't have to do anything. And if you don't have to do anything, isn't that how you got into this mess in the first place? Because you never did anything? So start doing your own research. Start looking up the information for yourself. Start proving this stuff to yourself. Don't take my word for anything. My word is nothing but mine. My word is, as LL Cool J would say, bond. But it's my word. All right. So let's get to the nitty and the gritty and see if we can add some butter and sugar to that and make it a meal. Ladies and gentlemen, what we haven't done because they want to nitpick on words. So we are going to have to nitpick on words. We're going to have to send a letter. Let me give you the organizations I am suggesting that you send it to. The Secretary of State for the United States, the Secretary of the Department of Defense, the well, I would actually not say to the Secretary for the Department of Defense. I would say the Joint Chief of Staff's Office, okay, because that covers all of the divisions of the military, because this is a military-industrial complex. Remember, you've heard that phrase before, haven't you? So we have to notify them. Now, we got those secretaries. We have the Secretary of the State or the territory for which you live. We have the Department of Motor Vehicles for each of the areas where you have lived previously and had a driver's license, okay? We have your birth state, the state where you were born, where you were brought out of the water into the land, meaning from your mother to reality, okay? We're going to send a notice of revocation a revocation of signature, termination of contract, termination of signature, all as a result, direct result of breach. And you're going to actually say that you have fulfilled the end of your obligation to the best of your ability. And what you're going to do is say, you're going to mention to them that payment has already been tendered, 
as a result of your full faith and credit and the United States government borrowing from your account. And 90% of what's been borrowed is now payable and due. So you're demanding payment. You are removing any and all liability from yourself and any and all responsibility as far as standing as surety that you will no longer be in a position to ever stand as surety or be liable for any of the conduct of the corporation. Now, a corporation cannot do anything wrong. A corporation cannot have conduct. And on this document, when you produce it, when you create it, because we're not going to do it for you. You have to come up with your own. Sorry. No templates. Not going to have a template for this. Other people will, but we're not. You're going to mention that you're a sentient, self-aware, conscious human. And you're going to mention that you have two arms, two legs, and that you are 75%. Well, no, we don't want to do the 75% H2O. We don't want to get too technical, and we don't want to do H2O because that puts you in commerce at sea. So we don't want to do the H2O part. We want to do the two arms and two legs. Um, don't have to do the ten toes, ten fingers. But no, it's not ten fingers. It's only eight. You got two thumbs. Thumbs are not fingers. Who said thumbs are not fingers? They look like fingers. They're attached to the fingers. They're used with the fingers. Of course, they're fingers. Okay? Just that simple. All right? And then you're going to take this letter and you're going to send it. Now, when you send that letter in, you're going to make a copy for yourself. And then you're going to send one certified and you're going to send one regular mail, the same way as a credit uh, agency does. But what you're also going to be adding in there is that you believe that they are collecting a debt in reference to this promise and what you're going to do is you're going to tender a payment by way of a promissory note. And you're just going to write up one of the our style money orders, but instead of labeling it money order, you're going to call it promissory note. Okay? No more, no more money orders. No more bills of exchange with the words bills of exchange. We're just simply going to label it promissory note. Now the unique thing about it is you're going to put it on a full sheet of paper. And you're going to get a notary. You're going to put the notary jurat at the bottom, which the notary certifies that you are who you say you are and that you signed it in front of the notary. And that's how you're going to send out your promissory notes, your our style money orders from now on. This is, what's the new secret for the hour style money orders? Okay, <laughs> so here you go. Here's your new secret, people. And we're just, now, there are more avenues for the hour style money orders. We are changing them up as we speak because we're going to do several different templates. And the reason why we can give that information to you the way we're giving it to you is because this one, there is no template out there for everybody to use. You have to create your own. Okay? Do you get it? Do you understand it? I hope so. All right. Now, what's been going on? How do we know what we know? Because we have been testing the courts out. Now, when we say testing the courts out, not so much the judges, but we're trying to figure out what's the jurisdiction, what's going on, how are they handling things, how are they handling affairs in the court. We believe we know. Now, what I was going to do is I was going to attach this to the Corey I video, but I figure what I'll do is I'll attach this to itself. The first thing I wanted to talk about, we've talked about, and now as I lay here in the middle of the day looking at the nice little clouds and the blue sky as I rock back and forth in the hammock, I'm not sipping on tequila or anything like that, but kind of relaxed, almost about to fall asleep. So I'm going to continue this in a moment, maybe about an hour, because I need to go and get some sleep. I've been going for too long, you know, just going and going like a energizer bunny and haven't had the opportunity of getting any rest. So I'm about to go get me some rest. So people, we'll be talking in just a minute about the other developments that we have discovered. Thank you all. Speak to you in a minute. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you didn't know how long of a break it was, but it's been about four hours. What 
I want to do, and I know that there might be an echo in the background, the video I put up with Corey Ibe is processing now. I did not know that by reducing the video quality, making it look uh, less than perfect, that my processing time would be drastically reduced. Uh, the video will be roughly a little over two hours long, and it's only taking about 30 minutes to process, whereas before, the same type of video would take me seven hours to process if I wanted to put it in a higher quality. So because it's mostly audio that you're listening to, you're just going to have to excuse the fact that it's not the perfect quality because the processing time was what's, what was killing me, and that's why I haven't been using A for... Um, I think it's called A for AVS video. I was going to say A for V, <laughs> but it's AVS video. All right, let's go ahead and let you all know what we have been discovering. Um, many people have been walking in the court, and they've been getting into debates with the court. The first thing, when you go in the court, you have two options. Either you want a contract or you don't want a contract. Just that simple. Because it's all contract. Just type in, it's all contract. Everything is contract, either of the two, and you will see. Now, hopefully we can make this make sense. So that, because I have another video that will be up right about the same time this one is up, and it will be talking about how I typed in, it's all contract, or everything is contract, and you'll see what pulled up when we did that. This is just to let you know, you just type these phrases in and you'll pull up the different laws and codes and everything, but everything is contract. Everything you do is contract. Why are we saying this? Well, every time you go to Walmart, Fry's, um, Burger King, Vons, Sears, Safeway, any of these places, ladies and gentlemen, every time you go to any one of them and you sign a receipt when you use a debit card or an ATM card, or you sit up there and you go to a gas station and you use a debit or ATM card and they have you sign the receipt. Please take a look at the terms and conditions on that receipt. It's a contract. Everything you do is contract. Sorry, you cannot exist in this world without contracting with people. Everything is contract. And I do have to finish that video and I won't be able to, but <laughs> everything is contract. And once you understand that, when you walk into the court, they're there to contract. So simply already have in mind what you're willing to accept and what you're not willing to accept. I'm not willing to accept being a collective entity. I'm not willing to accept not being recognized as a sentient two-arm feet or two-leg, excuse me, two-arm, two-leg man or woman. I'm not willing to accept that. Now, why are we saying two-arm, two-leg? Well, you'll have to look at the Treasury's documents as they presented it to the wonderful Maryland Secretary of State's UCC filing section because they listed themselves as having two arms and two legs. They didn't say sentient, self-aware, human, living, flesh and blood, conscious. They didn't say any of that. Go and look at the documents. Actually, look, it will behoove you to do the research because I tell you, those documents tell you a lot. And you don't find that too often where somebody gives you everything because they have to file their paperwork and it's a matter of public record and so we have access to the public record all right this is what we're doing um, we're getting ready to make some moves however we are not going to make so many moves that it is unreasonable and it will cause danger to any one of the members of the Legal Redress Commission. The first thing that we're going to be doing is helping people with their credit. We've already determined that. We had three choices. Either we did the lawsuit against the banks, or we did the lawsuit against the credit reporting agencies. Not the individual creditors, but the reporting agencies. Do you know that it is against the law for them to report a debt that they have not validated? And once you put in a request for validation, they must provide you that information? Well, I have several letters where they've never provided, and I've demanded that they provide validation. have several letters I sent out certified mail. These are the games we play. 
And so we're going to take the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act, and we're going to utilize that act as we file our lawsuits against these corporations, known as Equifax, TransUnion, and or Experian. We haven't figured out which two we're going after, but we do know we're going to get their attention. Now people say, well, aren't you jeopardizing everything by letting people know they can prepare for you? No, they can't prepare for us. That's the unique thing about it. You see, you can't unring a bell. Do, do you understand? It's already happened. So there is no preparation they can do because I haven't told you all the different wonderful angles we're going at. I, even, I haven't even told you all the different wonderful laws we're going to be using. So it's, a, it's this thing about information. There's such a thing as too much information, and there's such a thing as not enough information. Well, we're not giving enough information about this for them to prepare for us. They already know we're coming. They've been preparing for the people coming after them because of this for a long time. They've just been getting away with it. And nobody's ever articulated the argument in such a way that they have been afraid. I used to watch a TV show, and the show was called Stargate SG-1. Now, many of you are familiar with Stargate SG-1. Um, and I, Dean Anderson, Richard Dean Anderson, uh, MacGyver, <laughs> uh, starred as the wonderful, 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 wonderful uh, O'Neill. Colonel, he, I guess he was a lieutenant, <laughs> then he went to Colonel, then he went to Admiral throughout the show. They had 13 seasons of Stargate SG-1. And, well, let's just say the unique thing about that show was there was a character in it. And you know what I can't think of his Apophis. His name was Apophis, uh, after a Grecian god. But Apophis, the episode where Apophis dies, a god dies, and he literally says the words, I am scared. He literally said he was scared. Thus, in the intro that you hear, the young girl going, I'm scared. That's where it comes from from the episode where Apophis says he's scared. This is what we want to do. We want to put the type of fear into these organizations because what most of you don't realize, it's not about the banks. It never was about the banks. The mega banks, the major banks are doing this, the globalists and the major banks are doing that, and then they're doing this, and then they're, then they're also doing that. People, we don't care about what the banks are doing. Forget what the banks are doing. It's not about the banks. It's about what the banks represent. It's about the corporations. Do you not understand this is a corporate environment? The corporations are the ones that are in control. It's not the banks. It's not the lawyers. It's the corporations. And the corporations instruct the lawyers on what to do. It's all about corporations. It's all about contract. And because it's all about corporations, it's all about contract, get this. We need to rethink how we're walking into these courtrooms. So what I would tell you is write up your contract. Let the court know that you conditionally accept every single thing, that you plead innocent to every single charge against you. And you want them to produce, and this is, this is my take on this, you want them to produce the evidence to you, proving anything to the contrary. There is no evidence of guilt, do you not understand? And you want them to prove evidence against the person that is a human, sentient, conscientious, two-arm, two-leg individual. Now, here we go again with these words. Well, you can't use individual. Individual means this. Individual means that. No, because in your contract you say and you do not accept any other language than modern English as recognized by the Webster's Collegiate Dictionary. Just that simple, that you do not speak legalese, and if the court insists on speaking legalese, it must provide a translator. You don't have to insist on these issues, you just have to bring them up. The court will blah, 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 we don't want to hear that, you're one of these, you're one of those. Let them say whatever they want. I conditionally accept that upon proof of claim that you can prove everything you just said. Because if you cannot prove it, then apparently you are now slandering me. Now, we don't want you to, many of you 
are not quick at the tongue to handle most of the judges who do the word play. So I'll try to break this down simple so that you can handle it when you go into traffic court. Because a person like me has been in the traffic court several times, and I haven't paid a traffic ticket since probably 1995. And I, I haven't been to court on a traffic ticket at least maybe about six times since 1995. And all the time in between, I didn't know what to say. I just always appealed. And so you always appeal, no matter if the decision is slightly not in your favor. You always appeal. And that was a lesson I learned. Because the judges don't have time to be hearing appeals. And so the appeal will either get over, the decision will get overturned, or the judge will rule against you and say that the other judge was right. So then you appeal that judge's decision. And then you appeal that judge's decision. Now, if they want you to post a bond, tell them you don't have a problem with posting a bond. Tell them, give you a second, you'll go produce a bond, you'll get it notarized, and you'll present it to the court. Do you understand? The courts are asking individuals to post bonds. And we really need to tackle that. Those of us who have a knowledge of the, the laws and have knowledge of money and have knowledge of what's lawful money and the fact that the government borrows from the public. If they're borrowing from the public, when are they to pay the public back? If all of you out there who knows how to articulate this particular conversation, I would say assist me in articulating this to the powers that be. We have the law, I think it is 93-224, public law. If not, you'll see it on the video. That's um, <laughs> the actual uh, conversation with Corey I finishing. But nonetheless, there's going to be a little tweaking of the audio because when you listen to it, you're not going to be able to hear Corey too clearly, so you're going to have to turn the volume up. The only problem is... My speaking is the volume is already there, so the volume is already enhanced with my speaking, but not with Corey's speaking. The reason being is because when I was talking to him, it wasn't the intention on playing this back for anybody. So you're going to have to understand this was not a scripted conversation with Corey. And the, at the end of the conversation, I asked him if it would be possible for me to produce this video, to put it online for everybody to hear what we talked about because I think the information is pertinent. Now, people are going into court and they're trying all kind of stuff. They're saying this and they're saying that. They're saying they're not this, they're not that. I'm going to tell you, stop talking in court. Put everything in writing. And if they ask you a question, say, does not my presentment already address that issue? Is there another issue you have? Just that simple. And you put them in a position where we, we are going to start helping people with that with the Legal Redress Commission at redressright.com. Now, on this site, we're still building the site because the information has to be pertinent. So we're still building the site. So I'm going to say be patient with us for a moment as we put that site together. See, we were supposed to get started, and we did get started last weekend, September 15th. Okay, not September 15th. September 15th was the last weekend. Today's the 29th. Um, should have been the 20th. Should have been September 20th. So I apologize. Got the dates mixed up. And we did officially get started September 20th. We're setting up the corporation the way it should be set up. The organization is going to be set up in such a way that where we will protect the members who sign up with redressright.com. Now, please understand, when we say sign up, this is not a membership-based site. We're not going to do anything like that. You're not going to need to register your name and email address. If you choose to do that, that is your choice. But everyone who does become part of the Legal Redress Commission, the organization, yes, there will be a way for you to become part of the organization, and it's not going to be an astronomical fee. But you receive protection, and you become a member of the group, and if you know case law, that means that you're able to receive legal advice and legal information from us without there being any repercussions on your end or our end. And we can literally produce documents for you and assist you in your court matters. Now, we won't be able to handle every court matter out there. It's just not possible. Uh, our legal team is, let's just say, they're already bombarded. 
But what we will do is we'll produce templates, we'll produce uh, the informational videos explaining to you exactly what we're saying has worked. Now let's get back to the court thing. You put everything in writing. Um, Bill Thornton at 1215.org. Bill Thornton says it, and I believe Rod Class speaks of it as well, that you should never say anything in court. You should never have anything to say in court. Well, a person like me, I can't keep my mouth shut. Put me in court, and I'm definitely going to be saying something to somebody. So what you do is you make sure that you put everything in writing and you don't contradict what you've written and that you sign it. Now, people say, well, what about the notary thing? You don't have to notarize anything you put in the court. Okay, and listen to the video with Corey I. The information he gives and the suggestions about not using words that they use that reference the corporation, I agree with him wholeheartedly, and you'll hear me say that in the video. I agree with him. Now, we're going to cut this part short, and I'll continue this in a moment, um, probably a little bit later tonight or tomorrow, because I'm very, 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 very tired. It's been a long, long, long day. So I will get back with all of you momentarily. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be sitting here for a moment in the automobile waiting for things to open up here on this Sunday. thought I'd take a moment to clear up a couple of things and then we'll go back into the court issue and what we are finding is effective in going to court. Uh, the Corey Ibe, again, once I state it, is when you listen to that, you'll have to excuse the volume level on his end. It is not his fault. It is the fact that if I'm not with the phone recorders, for some reason, if you're not operating the speaker, you cannot hear the other party quite so well. So that's going to be the only problem with Mr. Corey is that you're going to barely be able to pick up his voice. Now, I'm going to turn down Champagne singing about how about us which was on the website recently as one of the songs in the background what I am finding is that <laughs> you know what it's unique that this song is saying some people um, people are interesting everybody wants to think that they are the greatest person on the planet well I'm sorry let me be the first to inform you that we are all what we are and we cannot be anything better than that. You cannot be any greater than who you are. Just that simple. If you are predisposed to greatness, you will have greatness. If you're predisposed to being a punk, you will be a punk. If you're predisposed to being a prostitute, you're going to be a prostitute. Now, didn't say that you can't change. But if you are predisposed to these things and you don't do anything to change then this is what you're going to be, and there's nothing you can do to prevent that from happening or stop that from happening. There is a lot, a lot, a lot going on right now um, with humans right now. Everybody wants to claim that it's the mystics, it's the stars, it's in the clouds, it's in, it's in the earth, it's in their genes. Look, it's in nature, human nature, moronic and dumb human nature. This is what humans do, and they do it often. Yeah, I just had a, <laughs> a police car pass by, and I, when they come back by, I'm going to uh, speak to them once again, uh, get their attention. As a matter of fact, for some reason, this is their routine. They pass by this area every single Sunday morning, at this exact same time. Now, if any of you know anything, police officers, security officers, um, are not supposed to keep the same schedule because individuals can learn that schedule. And that's exactly what's going on here. Individuals are learning that schedule. And it just doesn't make anybody sense. Doesn't make anybody sense. This is going to be going to be interesting. All right, I'm going to pause for a second because I have to go and take care of something, but I'll be right back to finish this conversation. 
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have Beth Midler going in the background. There's um, this thing about all of us thinking we are more than what we are. All of us pretending to be what we're not. All of us having images. I mean, you heard the saying, image is everything. And in reference to Jordan, and I don't care about individuals' opinions of this. It is a matter of fact. I try to stay away from opinion because opinions don't mean a thing. Okay, it's only in this world that an individual can have an opinion and somebody will put stake on it, but opinions don't mean nothing. The image is everything. They promoted and put that individual, Michael Jordan, out there on every poster and basketball and everything. And what happened? Well, what you didn't notice is whenever they played footage of Michael Jordan, they always slowed the tape down. They always slowed the replay down. Even in the NBA, when you watch the replay of Jordan, they slowed the speed down to make it appear that he was defying gravity, that he was gliding in the air. Image is everything. They needed a new poster boy for the NBA, and so he was that. Remember, you had, uh, what's his name, our dear friend, um, Dr. J. He was the poster boy. Remember always dunking Dr. Julius Irving, Dr. Pepsi, and all of this stuff. And then right after Dr. J, you had Magic Johnson. Now, right after, well, you had Magic Johnson and Larry Bird. And remember, they were pitting those two against each other. Got a lot of people watching basketball as a result of that so-called rivalry. And then, right after Magic Johnson and Larry Bird, they needed a new poster boy. But here comes this character. His name is Charles Barkley. And he just comes out of college. And, uh-oh, but Charles Barkley had an attitude. And he wasn't politically correct. And he stated what he stated. Oh, no, we can't have that. And so next thing you know, there's another character coming out of college who is mediocre. There's nothing unique about him. I mean, he's not breaking records or anything like that. He's not outscoring everybody on the planet. And his name is Michael Jordan. But he's nobody at this time. He gets drafted. And the next thing you know, his team is losing. But he's the one with the ball. And he's the one scoring. And he's the one having the highest score on his team, but they're still losing. And the next year they lose, and they just keep losing. But he becomes a star, and everybody wants to see Jordan, even though he's on a losing team. Image is everything. And they want us to believe image is everything. People, this has nothing to do with image. This has nothing to do with any of the stupidity. This has everything to do with us being people. This has everything to do with us being human. And let's stop playing with their words. Okay, fine. They may have invented, created the word human, but today human has a different connotation, has a different meaning. It has a different context than when it was originally penned or assumed. Now, this is what all of you must understand. We cannot invent a word. That's why you literally can't patent a word. You can patent a phrase, but you cannot patent a word. And do you know why you cannot patent a word? Because you're not the first person to say whatever word it is you think you've created. It is true that there's nothing new under the sun. So they don't have a master patent on any word. However, I choose not to use their words or phrases. And if you listen to the Corey I video, he talks about not using their words that signify corporation, like state. Instead of saying that I'm from the state of this or I'm from the state of that, you know, uh, <laughs> in the hearing that I played for all of you, the one for the hearing in California, the judge asked, what state did I live in? And I simply told him the state of consciousness. And I wasn't trying to be funny. I knew exactly what he was saying, and he knew that I knew. When we utilize the word state, 
I'm sorry, I was watching this lady um, and her child get in the car, and she literally almost closed the door on the child's hand. <sighs> sorry, that sends a big, huge, painful chill throughout my whole body when I think of that type of pain. Um, we should be using territories. I agree wholeheartedly with Tori Ibe, Tori Ibe, Corey Ibe, when he says that we need to go back to when they understood what a contract was prior to the other so-called states becoming part of the so-called union. They never became part of the union. The state of New Mexico, the state of Texas, the state of Arizona, the state of California were never part of the union. Uh, Louisiana, the whole Louisiana Purchase, none of that was ever part of the Union. The Union was created, go back and look at the documents, of 13 separate and distinct colonies that unified to create what was known then as the United States of America. And we're finding that in many documents they're referred to as the United States of North America to differentiate them from the state of Canada and the state of Mexico. So you have several different phrases that are being used, but on my documents, I specifically state the United States of North America. Just that simple. All right, let's get back to explaining the rest of our understanding of corporate words and because it's all about corporations it's not about the banks the mega banks the so-called 14 major banks or the five major banks or the 12 major banks doesn't matter they are not the ones in control it is the corporations who are in control and remember all banks are corporations the lawyers work for these corporations it's all about corporation it, it really is just that simple it's all about corporations and the control that corporations have. Why do you think the Supreme Court ruled that corporations under law are persons? And under the United States Constitution, they are considered persons. And they have constitutional rights. Interesting, ain't it? So the Constitution does not apply to the flesh and blood person. Now we're noticing that when they do their documents, they're listing themselves as whatever their name is, having two arms and two legs. Corporations don't have arms and legs. They're just making simple statements like that that seem ludicrous, but none yet the statement is being made. Okay, so let me explain to you what we're finding out, and we're not telling you all to go out there and try this. Do your research, prepare in advance before you go into a courtroom what you're going to say and how you're going to respond. Just in your mind, imagine what someone would say if you walked in there and said that my name is and I have two arms and two legs and I am not a corporate fiction. I am not a collective entity. Just imagine what they're going to say and just imagine the worst thing they can say. So what I can guarantee you, the first thing that they will say is, we're not going to have that in this courtroom. We're not going to allow you to sit up here and bring that into this courtroom. Then what are you going to say if they do that? Simply, oh, I apologize. Are you saying that this is lawfully a courtroom? Are you saying lawfully that this is a court of law? If it is, could you please state that on the record so we'll all know what jurisdiction we're in? Because when I looked up this corporation on Dun & Bradstreet, it clearly indicated that this was a corporation and that you were an officer of the corporation. And when I looked at Manta.com, it says this was a corporation. And when I went to Hoover.com, it said this was a corporation. So if you say you're not having that here, I agree that we shouldn't have that here. So could you please state on the record what this is. Do you or do you not work for a private corporation? And are you not at this very moment operating as an employee of that corporation? And he will do his best not to answer. And you simply, he's going to ask you a question. He's going to get yelling and then he's going to be upset. And he's going to sit up there and ask you a question. And you say, oh, no, excuse me. <laughs> Apparently you didn't hear me. So let me restate what I just stated. Are you 
working at this time and moment for a private corporation. Just that simple. I don't see what's so difficult about that question, either yes or no. And he will yell at the bailiffs, and he will yell at the um, other clerks of the excuse me, of the court, telling you to do this, telling you to do that, telling you this is the way it is and that is the way it is. And then you simply ask the question again. Are you or are you not working for a private corporation? If you are not, I am going to have to assume that you are. If you do not so state it now, I will assume that you are working for a private corporation. Just that simple. Okay. Now, let me see if we can move on to the next point after you get the whole issue as to what he's working for, who he's working for, and why he's working for them. Then you go ahead and you tell them, and by the way, because this is not a judicial proceeding, but a corporate proceeding, I will participate under the following terms and conditions. That 50 thousand dollars be credited to my account don't get outrageous don't get absurd just give them a figure that is reasonable and say fifty thousand dollars be credited to my account immediately for my engagement and I waive all liability excuse me let's say the word commercial liability and retain any and all rights secured to me by the laws of humanity not the not the constitution but the laws of humanity because it has been noted by the supreme court and the scholar who helped put together his legal international dictionary um or his thesis on international law mr hall that the laws of humanity are the basis for all laws in the world the foundation Interesting, ain't it? Okay, so when you do that, the court's demeanor is going to change. Then you just let them know, oh, I am not here to argue. I'm not here to be obstinate. I'm not here to be debative. I am only here to resolve this matter and to finally bring this to resolution and conclusion. Really, just that simple. Okay? No complications. It really is that simple. Now, what if he does this? What if he does that? That's when you're going to have to figure out what you say next. See, this is not for me to tell you everything that you say, because if we do that, they will just come up with other stuff to say to you that will change everything. Now, like Corey Ibe and I both said in the conversation, they are not your enemy. They are not there to cause you grief, pain, they are not there to cause hatred. That's not what they're there for. They literally are there doing a job. And they have been employed to do that job. For instance, some of you are police officers. And then some of you are ambulance workers. <laughs> you know, when one of my neighbors had an asthma attack and she died in front of me, um, the police pretended like they were working on her like they were helping her, like they were assisting her, like they were doing something to benefit her when they weren't. And I said to the police, the ambulance workers, she had died, and they definitely made it appear that she wasn't dead, that they were still working on her as they drove away with their sirens on. That is a policy that they have in California so that the relatives and families do not get irate. And plus, we lived in a project. So can you imagine a gang member's family member dying and them thinking that the paramedics and ambulance didn't do all that they could to save that person's life? Can you imagine if that gang member was out of control and if he had several guns in his house? What would happen to those ambulance workers and what that situation would turn into? So they have to pretend 
that they're still working on the person and wait till they get to the hospital for the doctor to declare the person dead. Remember, a paramedic cannot declare anyone dead. Only a doctor can declare someone dead. That's why they will say they were dead on arrival, because the doctor, when they arrived, declared them dead. And it is a declaration. And that's the issue. Declarations. Okay. Now, getting back to this um, fact that they're just doing their job and they're just being who they are, once you all understand that they're doing a job, you're going to go in there with the attitude, well, I'm just doing a job. No, it has nothing to do with your job that you're doing. It has nothing to do with the job that you're doing. This and you are two different things. It has nothing, one has nothing to do with the other. Okay? One has nothing to do with the other. All right, let's see. What was the next point we were supposed to be making here? When we are entering into these venues, we don't need to sit up there and have a special handshake. We don't need to know special codes and words, and we don't need to watch everything that we say. We just need to make it quite clear who we are not, and then we clarify who we are. Now, we came up with what we called the new identification card, and you'll see that on the site. That identification card has the space for a notary seal. And yes, you get all of the spaces for notary stamped because that's going to be a two-sided card. Okay? And you take that card, you cut it, and you put it in lamination. And some of you are going to get inventive and you're going to make it into what the standard size ID. And that's fine. Do whatever you feel if that's your choice. I tell you, don't. when you see my stuff, you take it and make it yours and you make it yours. Well, what we're suggesting is that that identification is lawful because the Supreme Court has stated what an ID must consist of. And their statement as to what an ID must consist of has those five points that we've stated in so many videos. Just that's as simple as it gets. It doesn't get any more simpler than that. Okay, let's see. What is our next point that we're going to be making this morning? I'm a little distracted because I'm in an area where I'm getting ready to go to the Sunday morning, what we refer to as Jehovah's Witnesses as our service meeting or meeting. Uh, we don't call them services because this is not a service meeting under the term service. This is the term service meeting because of what it addresses. And so... I said service meeting. That's on Thursdays. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is the public talk and watchtower study. The service meetings are on Thursdays for me. For some people, it's Tuesday, Wednesdays, or Mondays. But mine is Thursdays, and the uh, Sunday meeting is the public talk and watchtower study. Yes, that's right. We study the watchtower. Uh, you can't just give something to somebody without knowing what it says. And so we literally go over every publication before we hand it out to you all, we go over the publication because we have to know what the publication says if anybody calls us on it. It's that other thing about verifying the information. See, we also have to look up the scriptures associated with the Watchtower to make sure that the information is factual before we can hand it to anyone else. At least that is the policy. We should be verifying the information before we deliver it to someone else. All right. So I am a little distracted because we'll be getting started in about 33 minutes. And so I have some other work here that I need to take care of. So I just wanted to put this out there for some of you who are more than interested of entering into the courtroom arena because this is your interest. We have, um, <laughs> we have so many things going on here in this world. We have the fact that the United States Treasury has placed a lien on the Federal Reserve Bank and the Federal Reserve System. And as I told everybody, when they put a lien on the Federal Reserve System, all you have to do is go look at Title 12 of the United States Code, Section 411, where it talks about legal tender. And it says that all of the membered banks of the Federal Reserve Bank, okay, the Federal Reserve System includes all their membered banks, Bank of America, Wells Fargo. So quite literally, the United States Treasury put a lien on all the banks. And they did it with one swipe of the pen. 
they just typed it into the information and it became a lien on all of the banks. Imagine that. All right. That's the information that we, that has been out for well over a year and we're just now getting a hold of it. But what are getting a hold of it, the unique thing about that is we have been able to look at the document and decipher all the things that were added to it, that were not added to it, and it makes a lot of sense. Okay? Now, why did the Treasury do what they do? Why did they follow lean against the Federal Reserve System? Because their charter, their charter, not the not the Federal Reserve Act, but the charter was initiated in 2000, or excuse me, 1912 under the then president. And then after the charter was initiated, the president took it before Congress and Congress approved of the act. However, the charter is a 100-year charter, not the act and not the corporation. The corporation may be perpetual. The act may be perpetual, but the charter is not. The charter was a 100-year charter, and there has been no renewal of that charter. Okay? No renewal of the charter. So the Treasury knows this, and so does the Federal Reserve. So what did the Treasury do? It placed a lien on the Federal Reserve and the Federal Reserve system. Okay, now let's discuss what the Federal Reserve did. The Federal Reserve immediately, immediately, over four years ago, started buying mortgage bonds. Now, some people say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why would they be buying mortgage-backed securities? Ladies and gentlemen, understand what a mortgage bond is. You're not going to find this anywhere on the Internet because I've looked. Not Nobody is talking about what a mortgage bond is and explaining it. They're only talking about it and saying what they think it is. A mortgage bond works like this, Title 12 U.S.C. 411. Notes are legal tender. So they're taking that note, that legal tender, to the United States Treasury window. And the Treasury is taking that legal tender and it's converting it to a bond, known as a mortgage bond. Because prior to them taking it to the Treasury, it's only called a promissory note. It is not called a mortgage bond. It's only called a mortgage bond later. You don't believe me? Go ahead and take a look. The Treasury, under Title 12, USC 411, converts it to lawful money. What is lawful money? Well, you'll see that it included in lawful money are Treasury bonds. Legal tender is not lawful money. Title 12, Section 411 explains it quite clearly. Legal tender is not lawful money. Okay? That's how simple it is. Legal tender is not lawful money money. So they take the promissory note, which is legal tender, to the treasury, and they demand lawful money. And so they convert that into a bond. So the treasury receives the promissory note, and the banks receive consideration for having it converted to lawful money, for which they can trade on a stock market. And remember, stocks and bonds that's how it becomes a mortgage bond. And then what does the Federal Reserve do? Well, they have bought pretty close to $3 trillion worth of mortgage-backed securities or mortgage bonds. And these bonds are lawful money. So when their Federal Reserve note is no more, when it's a piece of junk, when it is not being utilized anymore, what's going to happen? They'll have $3 trillion to convert into what's the lawful tender at the, ne at the new time, at the next time. Now, people are saying, I was just listening, and I'm going to play it uh, during the next video. It's a song by Boys to Men, and the song is called Believe. And this song purports to tell you, me, and everyone else that the system is coming, the change is coming, and all we have to do is believe in the change and believe in ourselves, and everything is going to be all right. Literally, the words of that stupid song say this, and they talk about the New World Order. 
you don't believe me, go ahead and listen to it. It's called Believe. It's by Boys to Men, and they talk about those things. And I could not believe it. I didn't know it was Boys to Men at first because I just saw the title, and so I clicked on it, and I let it play while I was doing some other things on the computer. And I listened to the words, and I'm like, wait a minute. i got to find out who said this, who sang this. Because the way it was being sung, it was being sung like one of those rappers like, Jay-Z or, uh, what's his name, Kanye West, where they're supporting the so-called Illuminati and the New World Order and uh, Freemasons and so forth. Well, this was Boys to Men, and it really surprised and shocked me as to the things that they were talking about. And when I say really surprised and shocked me, I assure you that that is an understatement. Extremely shocked and extremely surprised. All right, ladies and gentlemen, well, that's going to conclude these sessions of audios. We're going to splice them all together, and what we're going to do is we're going to place these up hopefully Monday, manana. Um, We have the opportunity of being at a location where we can um, upload these to the Internet. I'm in an area where there's very little Internet, and the speed here, well, for lack of a better word, siphons yeah that's a better word siphons the speed of the internet here siphons for those of you who don't understand what siphoning is it means to suck so the speed here sucks just that simple um but i will make it work i will have to get direct tv i don't watch tv so you can imagine how i feel about having to go buy a tv and out here direct tv you pay monthly but it's no contract you just get the box and you do your own installation. <laughs> uh, all I can say is amazing. So I'll be connecting the Direct TV and hooking up and doing the installation, um, and then getting internet through the satellite. I'm going to suggest that all of you have a good day, a good life, a good night, a good time, and we shall talk later. Have a very good day, people. The first things, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gents, what I have just come to the conclusion of is realizing that people are selfish that people only want what they want and they don't care about how many people get hurt in the process of them getting what they want. So many movies are made about this. You know, see the villain goes after whatever he wants and he kills everybody in this way and causes so much damage and destruction just so that he can get what he wants. (sighs) Isn't it wonderful that such people are never satisfied? That they're never happy? You see, if you have goals that are selfish then you'll never be satisfied. You'll never be happy. You'll never achieve your goals. It's just common human nature. Why? Because that's the way humans are. You see, we are selfish by nature, which means if that is our nature, then we can never be happy because we already have selfishness. So if we're selfish by nature, we're always going to achieve selfishness because that is something that comes natural to us. So we'll never be happy because it's not something that's out of our reach. What is out of our reach? Caring about others, putting others ahead of ourselves. That's out of our reach. Well, what do you mean that's out of our reach? I can do that every day. No, you cannot be unselfish every day. It is not within human nature. For humans to be unselfish. It is completely within human nature for us to be selfish. All right, tonight we're going to talk about, and I call it tonight because I'm sitting up here after we had a nice little thunderstorm, and I really mean nice thunderstorm. The cloud was so dark that it was almost, can't call it black, but I can call it a cross between gray and black when you mix the two. And the lightning was powerful. I mean, the lightning bolts that came from this thing were thick. (laughs) They were enough to probably be, oh, I'd say six inches in circumference. So I'm used to seeing them about maybe a half inch or to an inch, but six inches, this was a pretty thick thunder 
cloud thunderbolts and lightning bolts. It was interesting. So after the storm, and isn't that what we're all looking forward to being able to be around after the storm? There's always going to be pieces to be picked up, but nonetheless, we'd be able to say we survived. And I used to tell people one thing that you couldn't get away from in life, because it was an understanding we all had to come to, is that everybody reaps what they sow. But I was reading over something the other day, and I, it was a scripture, and it was Matthew's, and yes, I'm going to mention a scripture. I haven't done it before, but I will mention it in these videos this time. Don't plan on doing it in the future. I'll mention it just now because it was something I've read over hundreds of times. And it's Matthews 24, 13, and 14. And it simply says, He that has endured to the end is the one that will be saved. Hmm. He says, He that has endured to the end is the one that will be saved. Then he says, and this good news of the kingdom will be preached in all the inhabited earth for witness to all the nations, the name will come. I'm not focused on number 14 right now. I'm focused on number 13. It says, he that has endured to the end is the one that will be saved. And then it continues, and this good news. Interesting. Isn't it good news to know that if we survive, if we endure, if we put up with whatever is headed our way? Isn't that good news? We'll be able to say, look, man, I survived that. The Great Depression, look at how many people survived that. The Spanish Influenza, look at how many people survived that. People, it's not always the greatest feeling in the world knowing you survived, but I guarantee you, you realize the fact that you survived whatever ordeal you survived, that if it were to happen again, you would be able to handle it again. So endurance is a means for being happy, for understanding that, man, that wasn't as hard as I thought it was. So, let's talk about a couple of things that aren't as difficult as you think it is. We're afraid. You're afraid, I'm afraid, we're all afraid. Let's not, let's not kid ourselves. Let's not kid ourselves. That's why when we walk into a courtroom, we all get that feeling, that nervous feeling, that, that, that feeling of unease. We all get nervous. Why? Because it's there to intimidate the person sitting behind the desk He's not wearing black on purpose. That is the color that they have chosen for that position. You see, they have made it mandatory that every one of them wear black. Now, they've been wearing it for so long that they don't realize that black, the color, and there is no black person on the planet. You will never, ever, 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 ever see a black person. Because there's nobody who fits the description of black. If you want to see a black person, go and look at Dragon Ball Z and watch Mr. Popo. Okay, and then you will see somebody who's black. But there's not a human being on this planet that has ever looked like that. We, we have this notion that because a person's skin is brown, or darker brown, or even a lighter shade of brown, that that's black. People, go outside and look at your tires, the ones that don't have white lettering on it, and you'll see what black really is. Okay, what, what does black mean? It just means the void of light. It's just that simple. That's what black is. That's what darkness is, the void of light. So, it's intimidating. Why? Because there's an unknown atmosphere, an unknown element to it. Well, the judges were black. They sit on a bench that's higher in position than you. So that's also another mechanism to intimidate. There's also usually someone in that courtroom that they control who has a gun, another intimidating mechanism. And then they use a language called legalese and laws that are based on that language, legalese, and you don't know what those laws are or the language is. And that's intimidating. Then they ask you questions that are designed to cause you to testify. And what do you do? You get nervous. Another mechanism for intimidating. When I show up in court, the first thing I tell them, when they ask a question, oh, I am not here to testify. Just that simple. I am not here to testify. Well, the question I asked you was relevant to this matter. No, the question you asked me was a question to the plaintiff. 
And I don't see how that question has relevance to this matter, especially if it's an irrelevant question. Make the court explain on the record what's the relevance. And if it does have merits and relevance, and if you know how to argue merits and relevance, then you proceed at that point. But once he explains it on the record, then you explain it for the record. But you've already announced that you're not there to testify, and you will not be giving up testimony, and you will not be permitting the elicitation of testimony. Any, any and all solicitation for testimony will be under coercion and duress. Just that simple. Many of you don't know these languages, so you're not there to argue with the judge. You just state what you have to state and state it as a fact. Now, some of the judges are going to try to pull your string. Now, you're different from me. I handle judges based on their personality. If he's an angry, cocky, arrogant judge, then I go in there and I put him in a position where I twist his words up. And I might use a little bit of sarcasm from time to time. But then I will ask him a simple question. I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize. But I'm having a difficult time understanding something. Are you working in a private capacity at this time for a private corporation? Hmm. Now, what some of you don't know, I have a case that there was somebody being charged with a crime in New Mexico. And so I stepped into the case and I ended up doing a notice of removal of the federal district court. When I noticed that they did the notice of removal, but they changed the case name, they changed the case title, they changed the case number, I realized that they were converting this to a new case. And it wasn't the old case. So when you have a case transferred, the number is supposed to stay the same. Just like when you go from federal district court to Supreme Court and the appellate court, you notice how they keep the same case numbers under the case? That doesn't happen with a notice of removal. They don't put the reference the old case number in the caption like they do in those cases. It becomes a completely different case, and it becomes a civil case. Well, I said if they're going to convert this to a civil case, I might as well do a civil case. So I did an addendum and made it into a complaint, a common law complaint. And I made it for $600 million. Well, they didn't appreciate that. As a matter of fact, instead of dismissing it, the judge ordered the case closed. Without response, he said that it was frivolous and that it was unintelligible. So I corrected him. I rebutted his presumption. And I asked him to prove it. He ignored it. Then he told us that the matter was now closed and so on and so forth. Ordered the clerks of the court to close the case and to strike every document from the record. <laughs> Not with me, you do. You don't get to do that. I don't play those games. So I proceeded to write the court back, ask for reconsideration. Then again, I corrected his presumptions, corrected his stupidity. He responded by saying that he had to deny the reconsideration because, first of all, we had alleged that the plaintiff was uh, being accused as being dead. He said the plaintiff is not dead, but the plaintiff is alive. So we have a judge on the record showing that the individual was alive. And so he denied the reconsideration. So later we receive notice from the court that the other party didn't sign the documents. And so he could not rightly entertain the document because it didn't have the other person's signature. And that I could not represent anyone. Nor I had never asked them to let me represent anyone. Never would I have asked for the ability of representing anyone. The law says a member of a group may assist another member of the same group in their legal matters. And that's all that was happening. This was a member of my group, and I was assisting them in their legal matters. I even included that case law, and the judge ignored me. So we're, we had a dilemma. Do we use case law, or don't we? Well, we told them the case law is for their benefit and compliance. Just that simple, for their benefit and compliance. Our use of case law is for their benefit and compliance. And any use of legalese will be construed as modern English. So it will be construed under the English definition. Just that simple. So every word within all pleadings, and we don't use the word pleadings. We use the word presentment. UCC Article 3, Section 501 talks about payment and presentment. Notice what a presentment is. Okay? I wasn't considering that when I started labeling my items presentments. Because I don't want to ever put a pleading before any man. 
I don't want to plead with no one. That's the first thing. No pleading. Well, what's the next thing? If you're not pleading, what's the next thing that they talk about? Well, they talk about motioning. I don't want to motion somebody to do something. That's just like pleading with somebody to do something. Okay, so what's the other one? Arguing? Don't want to argue because I don't want to be in dishonor. Don't want to demand because there's no reason I should be demanding anything. I should be presenting my issues before the court and they should be redressing those issues. They should be correcting the wrongs, which is what redress means. So I started introducing presentments and they've been taking notice of this. But there was something that happened today, um, a week ago, in that same case, since the judge decided to do a show of cause hearing for the individual, the other party, because they ended up signing the documents and resubmitting them back to the court. Ergo, correcting of the error, correcting of the deficiency, which is allowable under law, Judiciary Act 1789. Well, the judge told that person that it was frivolous and that he was going to bar them and sanction them for filing any more documents in the federal court. <laughs> so, of course, I had to respond because you don't get to play those games with me. So the first thing I did was I told them by putting the fact that the district court for the state of New Mexico is a corporation from Manta.com, included that in the document, very first paragraph, showing that they were a corporation, showing that it was a private corporation. Well, you cannot work for a private corporation and be a public servant. It is against the law. You cannot have private gains while working as a public servant. It is against the law in every state of the union. Okay, so not only did I do that, but I told him if that is the case, then he is an imposter. So I called the judge an imposter, said that he was pretending to be something that he was not. That it was a matter of fact against the law for him to be what he said he was, acting in a capacity that he claims to be acting. So I called him an imposter. Now, these are some very, very harsh words because they have some grave implications. Now he has the position of proving that he is not an imposter. I also told him that I knew that they were involved in a debt collection business, and I told him that they are to cease and desist any and all collection activities. Any and all collection activities. When you go to court, that is what they are involved in, is collection activities. So let's call them on that. See, I believe that this court is operating as a debt collector in some capacity or another. And until this court can verify the validity of such a debt, you are hereby commanded to cease and desist any and all collection activities. You just put that in writing to them and you send it to them. When you get a traffic ticket, you send it to them. When I walk into court from now on, I am waiving all benefits. And that includes commercial liability. Just that simple. Waiving all benefits and commercial liability. Why? Because I don't choose to operate in a commercial capacity in that sense. In that particular arena, in that particular instance. It's not my, it's not my job. That's not what I'm there for. And I choose not to operate in such a position, such a capacity, at that moment, at that time. I will pick and choose who I contract with. I also will accept the court's offer to contract only on one condition. That a total of $800 billion be paid to me immediately. And I'll accept the charges. I have no problem with accepting $800 billion worth of credits from them, because I could take care of a lot of people with that. People say, well, that's unreasonable. No, what's unreasonable is when you walk into court and they have you in your capacity as a corporation, as a fictitious entity, without telling you that you're a fictitious entity, corporation, a collective entity. Now, that word still hasn't dawned on many of you. Many of you still haven't gotten onto the collective entity bandwagon. The case is Braswell versus the United States. Go back and take a look at it. Oh, and as far as the courts being a corporation, being legislative or constitutional, look at Williams versus United States 1933. Both of those cases are on the PDF side of the site. In both of those cases, you'll see that it is explained that there are two different courts, legislative and judicial.
judicial under the Constitution. Article three court, that's the type of court we need. No, you don't want an Article three court. And I'll say that until the day I'm no longer breathing. An Article three court is simply this, unconstitutional, because Article three contradicts the Constitution. That's just that simple. So any law that, is, that contradicts the Constitution is void of law. That's the Supreme Court and several other courts that have stated that. And several of those laws contradict the Constitution. It says it's repugnant of the Constitution. It actually uses the word repugnant. Amazing. All right. So let's go ahead and explain to you what happened. We told you about how the courts were using both sides of the document and how from now on we're going to be printing on both sides of our paperwork from now on. Why? Well, because we realize when the courts send us documents from the district court, they print on both sides of the page. But the rules say that we can only print on one side of the page. Now, why is that? Well, that's because they have it to where they can use the other side of the page. They reserve the other side of the page for them. So at the bottom of our documents, we put the statement that we're not a collective entity. And we also place the words that the reverse side of this document is reserved for the sole use of the plaintiff or petitioner. Not petitioner, I'm sorry. We don't even like the word plaintiff, cause, but we can use the word plaintiff because it's a complainer. So the plaintiff and or the presenter's use only and for no other purpose. So the reverse side of this document is reserved for the presenter's use only and for no other purpose. Just that simple. And we put that on all our documents that we submit to the court and any other entity. So that they only, only focus on one side. And then we print on the reverse side of every page, this side intentionally left blank. Just that simple. Okay? That's how we present our documents to the court. Now, what have we found that's been working? Well, when I called the judge an imposter and said he worked for a corporation and said that in all likelihood he was a mason and that the court building itself um, served a dual purpose, one as a mason temple and the other as a hub for a corporation. Hmm. Things changed just a little bit, ladies and gentlemen. Things changed just a little bit. What we notice is when they sent this one back, they didn't print on both sides of the page. They didn't even print the whole page because it was sent to them on legal size paper. What we notice is that these individuals sent this document back with the reverse side of the page blank. I thought that was to be very interesting. Calling the judge an imposter, calling him a mason. Well, we didn't actually call him a mason. We said that he appears to be practicing religion from the bench. 